Chapter 4 The brig put to sea as I had supposed, in about an hour after he had left the watch. This was on the 20th of June. It will be remembered that I had then been in the hold for three days, and, during this period, there was so constant a bustle on board, and so much running to it and fro, especially in the cabin and staterooms, that he had had no chance of visiting me without the risk of having the secret of the trap discovered. When at length he did come, I had assured him that I was doing as well as possible, and, therefore, for the next two days he felt but little uneasiness on my account, still, however, watching an opportunity of going down. It was not until the fourth day that he found one. Several times during this interval he had made up his mind to let his father know of the adventure, and had me come up at once. But we were still within reaching distance of Nantucket, and it was doubtful from some expressions which had escaped Captain Bernard whether he would not immediately put back if he discovered me to be on board. Besides, upon thinking the matter over, Augustus, so he told me, could not imagine that I was in immediate want, or that I would hesitate, in such case, to make myself heard at the trap. When therefore he considered everything he concluded, to let me stay until he could meet with an opportunity of visiting me unobserved. This, as I said before, did not occur until the fourth day after his bringing me the watch, and the seventh since I had first entered the hold. He then went down without taking with him any water or provisions, intending in the first place merely to call my attention, and get me to come from the box to the trap, when he would go up to the stateroom and thence hand me down a supply. When he descended for this purpose, he found that I was asleep, for it seems that I was snoring very loudly. From all the calculations I can make on the subject, this must have been the slumber into which I fell, just after my return from the trap with the watch, and, which consequently, must have lasted for more than three entire days and nights at the very least. Latterly, I have had reason both from my own experience and the assurance of others to be acquainted with the strong soporific effects of the stench arising from old fish oil when closely confined, and when I think of the condition of the hold in which I was imprisoned, and the long period during which the brig had been used as a welling vessel, I am more inclined to wonder that I awoke at all, after once falling asleep, than that I should have slept uninterruptedly for the period specified above. Augustus called to me at first in a low voice and without closing the trap, but I made him no reply. He then shut the trap, and spoke to me in a louder, and finally in a very loud tone. Still I continued to snore. He was now at a loss what to do. It would take him some time to make his way through the lumber to my box, and in the meanwhile his absence would be noticed by Captain Bernard, who had occasion for his services in every minute and arranging and copying papers connected with the business of the voyage. He determined, therefore, upon reflection, to ascend, and await another opportunity of visiting me. He was the more easily induced to this resolve, as my slumber appeared to be of the most tranquil nature, and he could not suppose that I had undergone any inconvenience in my incarceration. He had just made up his mind on these points, when his attention was arrested by an unusual bustle, the sound of which proceeded apparently from the cabin. He sprang through the trap as quickly as possible, closed it, and threw open the door of his stateroom. No sooner had he put his foot over the threshold than a pistol flashed in his face, and he was knocked down, at the same moment by a blow from a hand spike. A strong hand held him on the cabin floor, with a tight grasp upon his throat. Still, he was able to see what was going on around him. His father was tied hand and foot, and lying along the steps of the companion way, with his head down and a deep wound in the forehead, from which the blood was flowing in a continued stream. He spoke not a word, and was apparently dying. Over him stood the first mate, eyeing him with an expression of fiendish derision, and deliberately searching his pockets, from which he presently drew forth a large wallet and chronometer. Seven of the crew, among whom was the cook, a negro, were rummaging the staterooms on the larboard for arms, where they soon equipped themselves with muskets and ammunition. Besides Augustus and Captain Bernard, there were nine men altogether in the cabin, 
and these among the most ruffianly, ruffianly of the brig's company. The villains now went upon the deck, taking my friend with them after having secured his arms behind his back. They proceeded straight to the forecastle, which was fastened down, two of the mutineers standing by it with axes, two also at the main hatch. The mate called out in a loud voice, Do you hear there below? Tumble up with you one by one. Now mark that, and no grumbling. It was some minutes before anyone appeared. At last an Englishman, who had shipped as a raw hand, came up, weeping piteously, and entreating the mate in the most humble manner to spare his life. The only reply was a blow on the forehead from an axe. The poor fellow fell to the deck without a groan, and the black cook lifted him up in his arms as he would a child, and tossed him de deliberately into the sea. Hearing the blow and the plunge of the body, the men below could now be induced to venture on deck, neither by threats nor promises, until a proposition was made to smoke them out. A general rush then ensued, and for a moment it seemed possible that the brig might be retaken. The mutineers, however, succeeded at last in closing the forecastle effectually, before more than six of their opponents could get up. These six, finding themselves so greatly outnumbered and without arms, submitted after a brief struggle. The mate gave them fair words, no doubt with a view of inducing those below to yield, for they had no difficulty in hearing all that was said on deck. The result proved his sagacity, no less than his diabolical villainy. All in the forecastle presently signified their intention of submitting, and, ascending one by one, were pinioned and then thrown onto their backs, together with the first six. There being in all, of the crew who were not concerned in the mutiny, twenty-seven. A scene of the most horrible butchery ensued. The bound seamen were dragged to the gangway. Here the cook stood with an axe, striking each victim on the head as he was forced over the side of the vessel by the other mutineers. In this manner twenty-two perished, and Augustus had given himself up for lost, expecting every moment his own turn to come next. But it seemed that the villains were now either wary or in some measure disgusted with their bloody labor, for the four remaining prisoners, together with my friend, who had been thrown on the deck with the rest, were respited while the mate sent below for rum, and the whole murderous party held a drunken carouse, which lasted until sunset. They now fell to disputing in regard to the fate of the survivors, who lay not more than four paces off, and could distinguish every word said. Upon some of the mutineers the liquor appeared to have a softening effect, for several voices were heard in favor of releasing the captives altogether on condition of joining the mutiny and sharing the profits. The black cook, however, who in all respects was a perfect demon, and who seemed to exert as much influence if not more than the mate himself, would listen to no proposition of the kind, and rose repeatedly for the purpose of resuming his work at the gangway. Fortunately, he was so far overcome by intoxication as to be easily restrained by the less bloodthirsty of the party among whom was a line manager, who went by the name of Dirk Peters. This man was the son of an Indian squaw of the tribe of Upsarokas, who live among the fastnesses of the Black Hills, near the source of the Missouri. His father was a fur trader, I believe, or at least connected in some manner with the Indian trading posts on Lewis River. Peter himself was one of the most ferocious-looking men I ever beheld, he was short in stature, not more than four feet eight inches high, but his limbs were of her Herculean mold. His hands, especially, were so enormously thick and broad as hardly to retain a human shape. His arms, as well as legs, were bowed in the most singular manner, and appeared to possess no flexibility whatever. His head was equally, equally deformed being of immense, immense size with an indentation on the crown, like that on the head of most negroes, and entirely bald. To conceal this latter deficiency, which did not proceed from old age, he usually wore a wig formed of any hair-like materials which presented itself, occasionally the skin of a Spanish dog or American grizzly bear. 
at the time spoken of, he had on a portion of one of these bearskins, and it added no little to the natural ferocity of his countenance, which we took upon the Upsaroka character. The mouth extended nearly from ear to ear, the lips were thin and seemed like some other portions of his frame, to be devoid of natural pliancy, so that the ruling expression never varied under the influence of any emotion whatever. This ruling expression may be conceived when it is considered that the teeth were exceedingly long and protruding, and never even partially covered, in any instance, by the lips. To pass this man with a casual glance, one might imagine him to be convulsed with laughter, but a second look would induce a shuddering acknowledgment that if such an expression were indicative of merriment, the merriment must be that of a demon. Of this singular being, many anecdotes were prevalent among the seafaring men of Mantucket. These anecdotes went to prove his prodigious strength, when under excitement, and some of them had given rise to a doubt of his sanity. But on board the Grampus, it seems, he was regarded, at the time of the mutiny, with feelings more of derision than anything else. I have been thus particular in speaking of Dirk Peters, because, ferocious as he appeared, he proved the main instrument in preserving the life of Augustus, and because I shall have frequent occasion to mention him hereafter in the course of my narrative, a narrative, let me say here, which, in its latter portions, will be found to include incidents of a nature so entirely out of the range of human experience, and for this reason so far beyond the limits of human credulity, that I proceed in utter hopelessness of obtaining credence for all that I shall tell yet confidently trusting in time and progressing science to verify some of the most important and most improbable of my statements. After much indecision with two or three violent quarrels, it was determined at last that all the prisoners, with the exception of Augustus, whom Peters insisted in a jocular manner upon keeping as his clerk, should be set adrift in one of the smallest well-boats. The mate went down into the cabin to see if Captain Bernard was still living, for, it will be remembered, he was left below when the mutineers came up. Presently the two made their appearance, the captain pale as death, but somewhat recovered from the effects of his wound. He spoke to the men in a voice hardly articulate, and treated them not to set him adrift, but to return to their duty, and promising to land them wherever they chose, and to take no steps for bringing them to justice. He might as well have spoken to the winds. Two of the ruffians seized him by the arms and hurled him over the brig's side into the boat, which had been lowered while the mate went below. The four men who were lying on the deck were then untied and ordered to follow, which they did without attempting any resistance. Augustus being still left in his painful position, although he struggled and prayed only for the poor satisfaction of being permitted to bid his father farewell. A handful of sea biscuit and a jug of water were now handed down, but neither mast, sail, oar, nor compass. The boat was towed astern for a few minutes, during which the mutineers held another consultation. It was then finally cut adrift. By this time night had come on. There were neither moon nor stars visible, and a short and ugly sea was running, although there was no great deal of wind. The boat was instantly out of sight and little hope could be entertained for the unfortunate sufferers who were in it. This event happened, however, in latitude 35 degrees 30 north, longitude 61 degrees 20 west, and consequently at no very great distance from the Bermuda Islands. Augustus therefore endeavored to console himself with the idea that the boat might either succeed in reaching the land, or come sufficiently near to be fallen in with by vessels off the coast. All sail was now put upon the brig, and she continued her original course to the southwest, the mutineers being bent upon some piratical expedition, in which, from all that could be understood, a ship was to be intercepted on her way from the Cape Verde Islands to Puerto Rico. No attention was paid to Augustus, who was untied and suffered to go about anywhere forward of the cabin companionway. Dirk Peters treated him with some degree of kindness, and on one occasion saved him from the brutality of the cook. His situation was still one of the most precarious, as the men were continually intoxicated, and there was no relying upon their continued good humor or carelessness in regard to himself. 
His anxiety on my account be represented, however, as the most distressing result of his condition, and, indeed, I had never reason to doubt the sincerity of his friendship. More than once he had resolved to acquaint the mutineers with the secret of my being on board, but was restrained from doing so, partly through recollection of the atrocities he had already beheld, and partly through a hope of being able soon to bring me relief. For the latter purpose he was constantly on the watch, but, in spite of the most constant vigilance, three days elapsed after the boat was cut adrift before any chance occurred. At length, on the night of the third day, there came on a heavy blow from the eastward, and all hands were called up to take in sail. During the confusion which ensued, he made his way below unobserved and into the stateroom. What was, was, what was his grief and horror in discovering that the latter had been rendered a place of deposit for a variety of sea stores and ship furniture, and that several fathoms of old ca chain cable, which had been stowed away beneath the companion ladder, had been dragged thence to make room for a chest, and were now lying immediately upon the trap. To remove it without discovery was impossible, and he returned on deck as quickly as he could. As he came up, the mate seized him by the throat, and demanding what he had been doing in the cabin, was about flinging him over the larboard bulwark, when his life was again preserved through the interference of Dirk Peters. Augustus was now put in handcuffs, of which there were several pairs on board, and his feet lashed tightly together. He was then taken into the steerage and thrown into a lower berth next to the forecastle bulkheads, with the assurance that he should never put his foot on deck again, until the brig was no longer a brig. This was the expression of the cook, who threw him into the berth. It is hardly possible to say what precise meaning intended by the phrase. The whole affair, however, proved the ultimate means of my relief, as will presently appear.